Hello, everybody, and welcome to welcome back to the ABT Time podcast. We've been away for a little while, and this is episode forty-four. Um, Matt, do you have any recollection of the last time we did an episode? Was it back in August? I think probably back in August. Yeah, it's been a bit. <laughs> yeah, um, still got the mug, and it's been a bit because we've been so unbelievably busy. I went to Nepal for a week to work with the World Bank folks training their leadership team in sustainability, um, as well as their South uh, Asia group. And we now have four rounds of the ABT framework course running at the same time, which are with the World Bank and the and Genentech and a split round between NOAA and FAA. And then with the Georgia Medical School Consortium CTSA, which stands for Matt CTSA. Uh, clinical translational science alliance, something like that. I yeah. think I, I don't think I nailed it. But close enough. <laughs> Over our heads, uh, <laughs> we don't know nothing about what they work on. We just help them with narrative structure, and that's how it goes with all these different groups, which is a great partnership. And that's that's uh, turning out to be an excellent. They're all great groups, so this is really fun doing four rounds. We do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, a different. Uh, group each day of the week, uh, including Monday mornings that start at 5 a.m. in California so that we can be talking with the people in Singapore and Nepal for that uh, World Bank group. So crazy time, been very, very busy. That's why we haven't gotten around to a podcast episode for a while. But that said, um, this is a great time to get back into the podcast because we have a major event that has taken place uh, this week, which is the launch of our new fifth and newest edition of the Narrative Gym series of books. So this is number five. The first one was the very beginning, about a year into the course. I wrote the first one just as basic idea of what we're doing, the model that we've been developing, the three-stage model for development of ABT strengthening. Then Park Howell came along and said, my business people aren't going to buy your book unless you put business on the cover. So we co-authored a revision of it for the business world, then same thing for the law world with Doug Passan, and eventually the same thing for politics with Dave Gold and uh, his longtime political strategist. And then began talking with Maros Douglas and Keisha Barr, who have been a part of the ABT framework course for a couple of years. And they've developed deep interest. They've been using the ABT with their graduate students. Keisha's at Texas A&M, Maros is at University of Arkansas. So they had a bunch of thoughts and ideas and opinions on it that they've been contributing to the course and finally dawned on us, wouldn't it be nice to make one version of this book, a new version of this book for the science world? But in particular, we began to think through who most needs help with communication, who's got the most at stake when it comes to communicating effectively. And the answer to that is graduate students and postdocs. So the thinking, and we present this at the beginning of the book, is that um, undergraduates are still somewhat supported in their career. They don't really are not out there making and breaking it yet. They're just getting the ammunition to eventually start making their way in the world. And professional scientists have already got a job and they're usually given a fair amount of support. So communication is important for both those groups, of course. But it's graduate students and postdocs that are there. And I know I was a postdoc for four very painful years. I've been there, done that. And your head is on the chopping block as you're trying to find a job out there. And same thing with late stage graduate students. So for that reason, we felt they're the ones that most will benefit from this uh, more practical version of the book than all the previous versions. And that's it was really good. We went to work on this thing, and I think we updated it with all that we've learned the past year of the course. Um, and so it's now available and it's really a manual for people to use in teaching the ABT framework at their universities. And one of the nicest things I think that we've done is that there are two appendices to it. The first one, appendix number one, is just describing laying out how you run a working circle, which is the real implementation of the ABT framework. It's eventually you build this model where you've got a group of people trained up and they can get together in these circles of five one person presents their narrative or more than five builders, the, the people that are going to help build, uh, strengthen the narrative. And we explain exactly how to do that. And so this is really the most practical version of our knowledge uh, to date that we're releasing and hoping that lots of graduate students will start to put this to use. So that's a little bit of setup on the basic idea of the book. 
The first author of this book is Marlis Douglas, second, Keisha Barr, and I'm the third author this time around because they're the ones that are really out there doing this work, and I thought it was important for them to take the lead on it. So on that note, let's begin our discussion with our guests today, which are my two co-authors for this new version of the Narrative Gym book, and Marlis and Keisha. How's about joining me here in ABT Timeland? There they are. And hello, Marlis. Hello, Keisha. We want to get right down to brass tacks here and get to work on this. So um, one of the things we talk about in the book is this default template that everybody should have programmed into their mind, especially graduate students, when all else equal, if you're asked spur of the moment to talk about something, the, the simplest default form is to just simply go with the timeline of past, present, and future. You should always know that. If you're, you're stuck in a group or something and somebody says, what's going on in your lab? You know, what have you guys been up to lately? Just give us the past, present, and future off the top of your head. You feel, well, you know, for the last three years, have been working on this. Um, but we've really gotten stuck on this one thing, which is what we're really focused on now. Therefore, we're doing the following work that's going to lead us somewhere. It's a very simple logical template that everybody follows and whether or not it works then is it depend depends upon your content what you fill it with and if you say a bunch of boring stuff then it ain't going to work so well but presumably what you're doing is interesting and that puts it in the ideal form for people to connect with um so on that note what we're going to do is i'll jump back and forth between the two of you and ask you to kind of follow that as a, as a starting little template of what we're going to talk about past how did you come across the abt and get involved with what we're doing and have you been using it present how are you using it now and uh future what do you think it could lead to other applications of it that sort of stuff so let's start with our senior author marlis douglas longtime member of the abt framework course and marlis uh start us off with how you came across the abt and got involved deep enough to want to write this book thank you randy um, I start with my childhood. I was a kid who liked to play in the water and was really excited about fish and I wanted to live with them. But I realized as a human, I can't live underwater. So therefore I went uh, to become a zoologist who studies fish. I got my master's and PhD at the University of Zurich. And then I moved to the US to become uh, a conservation geneticist, did some postdocs there. And conservation genetics generates genetic information that informs management of fish and wildlife. So then they know what, what different stocks there are or if there are different species. But those methods we use and the statistics are very complex and complicated. And if we don't communicate our research in a way that is actually understandable for managers who are not trained geneticists, then our research is pretty useless in that context. So I went out and tried to become a better communicator. And actually, it was, it was a long search. Uh, initially, I came across Randy's book, uh, Don't Be Such a Scientist. And it just resonated with me because of that title. And I realized, um, really, the trick to do is that book showed me what I do all wrong. And okay, wait, wait, wait a second. Let, let's go deeper there. Why did that title uh, resonate with you? Because I realized being a scientist, you're kind of different from normal people. <laughs> the way, you know, the way you talk, the way you think, the way you see the world. And it's just kind of hard to connect, especially with audiences who are not other scientists, who are not into fish, who are not into the nerdy, geeky, stuff we're interested in so um that was very hard and uh, how how <laughs> how much did you connect with the inner circle outer circle diagram when you first came across that did that kind of resonate yes that was one of these light bulb moments really and especially this emphasis that your inner circle is so much smaller than what you actually think it's really really tiny you know sometimes even within our own lab the more advanced students can talk about things the new students don't understand yet. Okay, so give us the condensed, super short version of the little story you tell at the beginning of the book. <laughs> okay, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, that was very funny. Um, 
one of my students uh, was, he did great research and um, was really, um, yeah, just, just a fabulous student to work with, doing great research. And he was so despaired because he felt nobody cared about his research, uh, only on a little group. And so how do I help this student? I uh, remember my own, nobody cares about my research little episode and it actually happened when I finished my master's. And my mom asked one day, so what did you actually do for your ma master's? Tell me about it. And so I went ahead and of course I used jargon. It was, the study was basically about baby fish. Uh, I had to study with scuba diving and then all the fish died. And then um, that was the experiment and I wrote it up. So it was kind of an evolutionary trade of, of resource allocation. And this is one of those nerdy words for most people that doesn't tell them anything. So after I talked and talked and talked, my mom looked at me very seriously and said, people find this interesting. And I was just floored basically because I'm thinking, mom, this is what I worked on for the last three years, poured my heart and soul into it. And it's important. It, the baby fish are dying and, and nobody cares. So, uh, but this really was a very good reminder for me that even somebody who really truly cares and wants to know what they do, not so much about the science, but the research didn't understand because I, I did a very poor job telling her um, what I did, conveying it to her, tying it to her interest, speaking a language she can absorb. And, and actually, <laughs> we have to take a side moment here with Keisha, which is uh, because we referenced this in the book. Um, what comes to mind when I ask you, so what, what exactly is it that you do here? <laughs> Yeah, you know, that's so funny because that's a line I use during my communications course, and it's from office space. And my students, out of 15 students, none of them understood that reference. And I was just thinking, how do you not know this? And also, people get asked this all the time what exactly do you do here? But they didn't understand the two Bobs reference. Yeah, the two Bobs. I mean, what, Matt, can you check what year is office space? What was that release around 2002 or something like that? Um, brilliant movie, but clearly from a previous generation, <laughs> 1999, 99, there you go. So yeah, it's 23 years old <laughs> already, but iconic moment. So let me just ask, what exactly do you do here? Would, would you say you do here? And then the guy starts stuttering and stammering. Basically that gets into Shirley's law, which is, you know, you can't tell your own story of what you do here then the two Bobs are going to assume you do nothing, which is what they do in that scene. That's a perfect scene mm -hmm. relevant to, but unfortunately a lot of our younger readers will have to go see the movie to fully grasp that. Um, so anyhow, and on that note then, okay, so that's catches up a little bit. Um, Keisha, same sort of question is what brought you around to the ABT? How'd you first come across it and connect with it? Yeah. Well, you know, listening to Marlis's story reminds me, when she says, don't be such a scientist from your first book, it reminds me of my graduate training was only be a scientist, don't be anything else. And I think that resonates with a lot of our current graduate students where we think that they only do research. And that's how my graduate training was, is only do research. Don't worry about anything else. You're only focusing on researching. And that became really challenging for me when I was completing my degree and I experienced my first coral bleaching event. And part of this was, I was really excited to see these changes that are happening and these corals that I've been studying and learning more about. And we went out and documented this whole event and we're like, wow, this is so amazing. All of these animals are responding the same way. And then we went and published the paper and we're like, okay, we did what we needed to do. This is what we were taught as scientists is that you need to be able to do research and then publish that. And that was your form of communication. But then the following year, that bleaching event happened again, and no actions happened. Nothing changed. No one really cared about it anymore. And everyone kind of just went on living their lives. And for me, that's when I realized that we needed to be more than just researchers. We needed to be communicators. And we needed to be communicating with people outside of our own circle as well. Not just people that are doing research, but our policymakers, our managers, and also our public. You could kind of say if a bleaching event happens in the forest and nobody sees it <laughs> did it ever really happen um or on the coral reef uh 
Yeah, same type of thing. So what did you begin to do towards pursuing that direction? Well, so after that, I, you know, of course, went to Google and said, how do you communicate effectively? And <laughs> oh, that's an interesting exercise. <laughs> well, you know, that's what we all do. We all Google everything that happens. And um, <laughs> what, what I found was all these different lists of tips and tricks of how to be more effective in your communication. And the number one thing I found, which of course, you know, Randy is know your audience. Mm -hmm. And while that is helpful, that doesn't really help in terms of how do you structure information or what types of information do you share? So I kind of pulled all this information together and I tried different parts of it. I tried grabbing attention, using some different types of um, before and after photos of reefs alive and reefs dead. I tried using humor. I, I guess I'm not very funny, so that didn't work really well. <laughs> um, That's pretty funny to say, actually. <laughs> and and you know, and I tried all these different things, but it just seemed very piecemeal. And I kind of just went on doing those things throughout my graduate uh, degree. I wrapped up my postdoc, and I somehow got a, a position as a tenure track professor um, at A and M. Uh, don't tell them, but I didn't know how to really communicate. I just tried to do all these different things and kind okay, of- Okay, wait, wait a second. We're going to take a little momentary side on that note because this is really interesting because one of the big cheeses in the epidemiology world that I know, tells who's a communications expert, tells me over and over again, the problem you have when you get to the higher levels of the medical world or all of these professions is those people that are so far up there that have been hired all these jobs, they feel they got there because they're brilliant communicators. And, you know, some of them are the worst communicators imaginable. But as my friend tells me, they're not going to listen to you because, you know, if I was so bad at communication, how would I have gotten this big fancy job? That's very honest of you to be admitting what you just said, which is somehow I got the job and knew that I still wasn't that good of a communicator. But, you know, just don't ever lose that trait. Don't end up as one of these giant program directors or something where, oh, well, the only way I got up here is clearly I'm a brilliant communicator. I, I mean, literally, I deal with so many of those people and gets back to the listening thing. They're not about to listen to anything. They mm -hmm. just plain think they've got it down. So, yeah, keep going. Yeah, well, you know, it's funny you say that because I think that I somehow had evidence that I was a good communicator because my first class that I was slated to teach was a science communication class. <laughs> so I really fooled them. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Clearly. If I was so bad, why would they give me this course to teach? <laughs> yeah. And then they're like, okay, now I'll go teach everyone else how to communicate, even though you don't really know how to communicate. <laughs> and now keep going on that, Lose, because that's a story that that's actually the story you tell towards the end of the book. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And you know, part of this is I you pulled all this information together, what we've been referring to as a box of ornaments of uh, these different tips and tricks of knowing your audience, um, having some kind of shock factor doctor and telling a story. Um, and I gave all of that information to the graduate students that I was teaching my first semester that I taught this class. And I kind of felt like, you know, this is okay. This isn't the best. I, I really didn't feel like I helped them. I just gave them the same box of ornaments. And I, I just left feeling, left that course feeling like I didn't really help the students at all. And I probably just let, led them down like a really bad path. Um, so after that, I saw your your class come through our coral coral listserv, where I um, quickly enrolled in that, and I was happy to get accepted. And when I started taking the ABT framework course, I realized that at that moment I was doing everything completely wrong, and everything made sense after that. And the reason why people weren't listening or people didn't know what was going on or what I was trying to say to them was because I just was throwing different pieces of information at them. It was com complete, completely unstructured. And it was really hard to follow. And my mom probably didn't care about my research either, Marla. So <laughs> you're not alone. <laughs> exactly. So then after that, that kind of, um, I would say that was the moment where everything changed and I had to completely throw that syllabus out the window and restructure my entire course after that. Because I just had that immense guilt that I completely failed my students. And now I could provide a more structured way to teach science communication and give that to, back to the students. Yeah. And then Marla, same thing for you. You, you began teaching uh, communications workshops or, or uh, seminars or something with the students. Actually, I first used it in lab meetings where students just have to say, what are you working on? Um, especially new students trying to get into their research. And um, I really re recognized that 
the more advanced the students were, the faster they grasped the ABT, they saw how useful it was and they could really do something. So the students who just start, they don't really have a research question yet. And what they're focusing on is doing, I'm doing conservation genetics, I study fish, but that's the very, very last part you really want to say how you do something. You have to first have a problem. I mean, that's the quote the book starts with, nobody buys a solution without the problem. And um, so that really helps in a way shaping their thinking is what is really the question you want to ask here? And you know what, what you're getting to there is about focus. And one of the powerful things about the ABT, it's like you're saying, Keisha, um, so many people can give you shopping lists of tips and, and tricks. And in the beginning, there were a bunch of well-intended science communication people that contacted me and said, oh, we want to add our the ABT to our list of, of tips and tools and tricks and hacks. That was the word that really irked me. And I got into a few minor spats, which is, it, it's not a, a tip or a, a trick or a hack or anything like that. It's the whole way you do communication. It's your starting point. It's your focus. And when somebody, you know, says, what do you have for advice on communication? If you go through a list of 10 different things, well, don't do use jargon and worry about your crime and do this and do this, this, they walk away with next to nothing. You know, it's like, which is most important of all that? The answer is start with ABT. You know, here's one thing, get get an understanding with ABT is, and then everything radiates out from there. It tells you so much. It tells you that inner circle, outer circle, so many other elements, but it's a matter of having a clear singular starting point. And I hadn't really thought about that quite so much until you're talking just now about this idea of being handed a whole box of stuff. Where do I start on all that? There is an answer. It's the singular thing, the ABT. And that's the power of the ABT is that it's one, one thing. Um, there's a book that just came out about storytelling and how it pervades everything in our culture and what to do about it. But they don't have a model. They don't have an ABT. You know, they probably got at the end of the book. I haven't even seen it. I don't think it's even out yet. I think I, two people have sent me advanced reviews of it. And I'm sure it's got a big, long chapter at the end that's just another shopping list of here's a whole bunch of things. Every time you hear misinformation, go confront it and, and set the facts right. Blah, blah, blah. Sorry, the ABT gives you a singular model to go about these things with. Um, now, that said, um, I did nev I never put together the ABT idea with any ideas of having something that could be borderline offensive or provocative as a, a central term for this whole ABT notion. And yet, once we got going on this book, the two of you together insisted that we have to include this term that your people had come up with, the butt bomb. And I told you in the beginning, I don't know, that's that's a little <laughs> off-putting to me. But the more I began to soak it in, just like that quote um, that you mentioned that opens the book, it, it's it's absolutely everything. The butt bomb is everything. And everybody just better start getting used to it because that's where communication begins is with the butt bomb. So one of the two of you tell me where this term the butt bomb originated well i'm going to turn this over to marlis because she is really the brains behind it so she can take all of the the, the butt bomber <laughs> go for it keisha is so much more skilled at that you know she first goes in and said oh i blame it on marlis she should tell it now <laughs> well, <laughs> the one thing was um you know as scientists we always use however kind of the much milder version of it and but it's so much more forceful and this is what you really want to convey with the abt this transition this this very sudden thing and um so my, one of my students said well he actually doesn't want to say the word but because his juvenile brain thinks of an anatomical part <laughs> and so then he's derailed he can't think about this research anymore so then i thought Hmm, actually, um, that's a really good description. When you ask a student, what's your problem or what's the question? This kind of, yeah, scientific and so on. But if you ask them, tell me what's your butt bomb? You know, what is this? What really is, is the problem, this disturbed? I think of it as a placid lake. You know, every, everything is good. The, the, the fish are living in the lake and whatever. And, but then you you drop that bomb and it's like throwing a rock into that that glassy lake and it has all these ripples so it really makes a big splash a big effect and, and, and by I the way and by the way if you're standing on the shore and you're you're scanning across the whole lake looking at everything you know peacefully where's your eye going to go 
when somebody throws that rock. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and so I thought that was just conveys to students really, really well how important it is this transition to scientists always start with the problems. We have climate crisis, we have uh, species declines and so on. And that already sets up a bad kind of mindset and turns most people off who are not working on these issues. But if you kind of make it such that you say first, oh, you know, fish have to live in a, in a healthy lake and then you can go fish them with your grandchildren, but the, the pollution in the lake actually kills all the fish. That makes an impression to me because he connects with them first. Yeah, the, the lake, the fish, but. And, and, and so and, on that very note, um, and I don't want to get too deep into this, but next week I'm doing a podcast with a, uh, that a guy has on climate communication. And I went and looked at the transcript of Al Gore's movie, An Inconvenient Truth. And you just wouldn't believe how that movie opens. It, it's exactly the mistake you're talking about. There is one paragraph of this ethereal, ethereal thing about, you know, you look out in the forest and everything's peaceful and wonderful, blah, 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 blah. Um, and then there's maybe one sentence about we've got a, a oh, you know, there's a picture from outer space, you know, we live on this blue planet. And then it, it literally the word, but, but we're destroying our atmosphere. We're ruining everything. So he drops the butt bomb at the very beginning. And what does that do for your narrative? Well, you've got nowhere to go. You know, you, you don't get to set up a world, anything like that. Tell us what's important, what's meaningful, what we hope the future will look like. You just instantly have exploded everybody's brains and everybody's running around panic. Oh, my God, it's all falling apart. And I think the traditional thing with environmentalists is, yeah, OK, at the end of your whole presentation, the last thing you want to do is give people hope. Now that I've told you everything's ruined, but it's not too late. We can still it's just so backwards in that regard. So that's really great to hear you. Uh, say that now, Keisha. Do, do you concur with the butt bomb um, terminology? <laughs> yeah, and you know, one thing that I'd like to just add to what Marlis was saying about the butt bomb is, I've been trying to tell my students that you need to make that transition very dynamic, and I think that's what the butt bomb does. Is like, just don't say butt, and then have all this other, you know, the the how come afterwards, but give me the what, like what is happening right away, and I think that's very non-traditional of how scientists approach things. We want to describe all this information, how we did this thing, but we don't get to the point. And that's one of the biggest things that I think it's kind of ingrained in me now is when I hear people talk, I'm like, just get to the point. Like, I don't care what else you're saying, get to the point. And that's what the butt bomb is about, is getting to the point right away, make that contradiction. What is the problem? And then give us the solution. Ease the, ease the mind after that. So that that's actually something that's been ingrained in my everyday life now where I'm like, get to the point faster because we need to have that transition and then I need to help come up with solutions or you tell me the solution right away just because of this narrative training. That's really, really good to hear. Um, and the, as I said, the more I soaked in the butt bombs a term, I finally voted that we put it on the cover of the book. Um, and so that's where it is up at the top. Um, but bombs and if thens and hell, oh my, uh, <laughs> an homage to the Wizard of Oz. And, and I would is, like to add here too yeah. that the but bomb, because you're so aware of this tra dynamic transition, it also makes you think what comes before upstream. And that really helps, goes back to your question now about inner circle, outer circle. That really makes you start thinking about what do I have to tell the people? before I come to the problem, before I drop that butt bomb. So we really start thinking, what do they care about? How can I connect? And so I think this helps in addition, especially if you have a little more experience with setting up ABTs and thinking in that framework. Yeah, um, it's so much fun what we're doing with the ABT framework course. And there is an element of it, of the little engine that could, or something like that, of underdogs. Uh, this is not a giant foundation funded or government funded or anything project that we're doing. Nobody's been paid in it other than Matt and myself for running the, the rounds of the course. But the other 20 or so people that are taking part have all been volunteers, shown up and given lectures over and over again in the sessions as we've all brainstormed this thing for two and a half years. And we're making major progress now. By the way, we had a meeting this past week with the three head guys at Pfizer we've been working with for over a year now. And they we're now organizing what we're calling ABT 3.0 there, which is that they are getting so much out of it that we're propagating to other programs. Um, they get it. And I think that's partly because they're in the corporate world and they're driven. They really want need solutions. There's a fire burning under them. 
And we're finding our way to all these groups. And the World Bank people, they desperately need it. You would not believe that that World Bank thing, it's, um, 180 countries, 10,000 employees, and the most mixed up structure to the whole thing. Nobody over there in Nepal of all these head people from around the world could really clearly explain to me the exact how does this whole system work? Well, we're broken into regions, but then we're also in different programs. And then those overlap with all these things like, oh, man, you need the ABT so bad. They needed it about 40 years ago when they put together all their organizational schemes. Um, it just goes on and on. Um, let's see. How about from each of you? And we're going to wrap this up pretty quick. So this is just a little teaser for people to get inspired to jump into the book. But um, tell us for the future one direction you're going with using the ABT. Uh, maybe start with Keisha. You know, I'm actually really glad you asked that because this is something I've been reflecting on this past week is kind of thinking about how I've been using the ABT in a different way. Um, I've been working with my, my students, my graduate students with the ABT, and I have some new students that just came on that haven't really got the ABT under their belts yet. And one of the things that I've noticed is that with the ABT, they'll put it together. And some other students also just put in, you know, I'll put an and statement, I'll put a but statement, I'll put a therefore statement. And it's not the, the level of um, narrative structure that we're actually looking for. But what I've noticed with these students is that they're lacking clear um, background information based on what their problem is. And it actually has helped me direct them of in order to really understand and set up your problem, you need to know more about this information so you can present that to your audience first. And I think this is kind of a, a different, it's kind of flipping it where I'm learning what they don't know based on how they're structuring their ABT. It's kind of flipping it on its head. And it's something I've been thinking about the past couple days of like, oh, wow, this could actually really help me help my students get that background information that they're lacking because they don't. Well, know and so what, what you're talking about now is the same thing that we've all been on this journey. And Matt and I are probably the deepest of all in this journey. And we're still two and a half years running this course and we're in the 30th round of it. Um, and we're still having those sorts of same things you're saying, you, you, you know, on a daily basis, like, wait a second, what if I do this and this and you're still, we're all figuring out how exactly this works. I can't believe some of the elementary or basic things that we're still piecing together. Um, that is excellent. And Marlis, the same sort of thing, how you're using it with? Yeah, absolutely. Just I want to echo what uh, Keisha says, using it with students. And even if they don't quite get it at the beginning, it really helps them through their own me. First, you have to figure out questions. Then you learn how to address these questions. And then when you finish up, you come, how do you put it in a context to give a presentation for a job or at a big meeting? What I also would like to do is bringing this uh, very, very useful approach to professional societies. You know, there are so many uh, students, but also professionals who haven't known, haven't heard about it yet. And so we want to spread the word A about the book, but then also we thought we could do some webinars, uh, Keisha and I jointly, where uh, we just very briefly say this is the ABT, they, they have to read the book and then maybe they can work in little uh, breakout rooms uh, on Zoom. It's very easy to do these uh, working circles and it's not about coming up with the perfect ABT. It's really about practicing it and learning it. And so we hope that then once we tell them, hey, this is how you can do it, that they can self-organize too. And so we really, really hope that the world, world word <laughs> about the abt will spread um yeah of, and, hey, and you know that. one one thing i want to add on that and this is maybe what we'll kind of wrap this up on and this is maybe a, a borderline awkward but it, it's social dynamics all this stuff is and that's always hard for scientists because you know a lot of people go into science thinking it'll be this clinical sterile world they get to work in a lab but you know they get shocked but you still got to go to meetings you got to interact with all these human beings um and Brian Palermo is probably going to hate me for telling this little story, but uh, I, I want to share it at this point. And hopefully he's listening to this and, and right now hearing this part. Um, about, oh, 10 years ago, there was a major conference that we'd set up. He and I were going to go there and he was going to do the improv stuff of communication. I was going to do my usual thing. And he got booked on a TV show just a couple of days before departure. And they're paying him a pile of money, way more than the science people were going to pay. And so we had a, a basic understanding when that happens. There are other people from the Groundlings Improv Comedy there that he works in that are equally good at doing the stuff and that he could find a replacement. So he did. And the 
person he got to replace himself on this conference uh, was a woman in her late twenties um, who was very, very good with improv as is he. I mean, he's one of the grand masters at this point, you know, he's now in his fifties and is so experienced and, and furthermore has had more than 10 years of working with science groups. So his base of knowledge is, is really powerful. But that said, she came along in the conference. Um, it was in Hawaii, actually, at the Hawaii Convention Center. And we did the workshops. And the first thing I noticed was that at the break uh, time, so many of the graduate students are young women, and they just congregated around her. And they sat down, and they were all the same age. And they had conversations that there's no way those women could have with Brian. I mean, Brian's great, but there's just basic sociological elements at work there. And it's the same thing we're looking at here with this book which is why you know I really wanted the two of you to be the lead authors take the role there which is I've done lots of work on communication stuff but you know look at me I'm 67 I'm getting to be over the hill it's time for me to head out to pasture to some extent more importantly I'm caught up in trying to do battle with these older white males that run the biomedical community in particular that have done such a rotten job with communication in the past two and a half years. They should apologize to our whole society for how they botched it. There's been all the articles about CDC and NIH and what a mess they've made out of it all. And the mistakes made there are so simple and fundamental that I'm really focusing a lot of my effort in that direction. But it's very important to have the two of you now getting out there as ambassadors for the ABT and, and doing exactly what you're talking about. And it helps cross that divide to some extent, you know, the gender divide. It's just natural. You just peer groups that you feel easier talking with people like that. So having both of you get the chance to go out there and go to meetings and, and especially with the power of Zoom now that we haven't had before, that you can do some of these events. And I've also fought long and hard for the past uh, really seven years to create this basic core model of 10 one hour sessions that are needed to really begin to get this stuff to develop intuition. And I've turned down all sorts of places uh, one of the big bosses at NASA met with me and said, we love this training. We want to do it here, but we need you to cut it to five hours. And I had Mike Strauss send him an email saying, why would you do that? It's in the second five hours. We see the beginnings of narrative intuition. That's the whole goal of it. Um, and so we turned that or that never happened. It could have happened, but that's OK. We've kept this model intact. And yet now we've established it enough as the brand, this is the right way to do it, that I'm now comfortable with doing variations on. And as you say, go to the science meetings, do an afternoon session on the ABT, do what you can, whatever to light some fires. We've now got this book that really lays it out clearly in a book form of what the model is and get to work on that. So I think we're at the perfect point in time for you guys to take the book in particular and get out there and just get people reading it and using it. And there's just so much benefit I think that can be had from, because we know we've got seven years of tons of emails of people like, Oh my God, this changed how I approach everything. It's, it's that fundamental. So on that note, have you got a final statement? Um, Keisha? Uh, yeah. Just to add to what you're saying, Randy, you can't just do this one time. And that's the whole goal that Marlis and I have moving forward is to bear to build this narrative culture that people can't just read the book and that's it and they're done. They got it. They need to go out and communicate with other people and keep doing it because if, if you stop, you lose it. So we really want to build that community where people can talk with each other and practice. Perfect. Narrative intuition. Use it or lose it. And Marlis, the final word, the lead author. And that's actually where the title comes in, the narrative chain. So it might not make sense initially that this is actually a book about, you know, how to communicate with uh, different audiences, but you have to practice constantly, like, you know, exercising, like any sports, like any instrument, but it's really much more like, like in a gym. You have to dedicate yourself and you have to do it regularly, set up a schedule or use it for all your communication. I mean, I now practice, practice it when I teach, when I uh, communicate with other people, when I write emails, and each day I learn more. So it's really the more you put in, the more you get out, and it's not just with a 10 week course or you read the book, just use it, start making it a habit, then you will get better. Uh, that's a perfect, perfect note to finish on. And there, there's, I don't think we've ever had anybody say, yeah, I learned that AB thing and it's not for me. You know, I mean, nobody's ever gone against, I'm going to go back to and, 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 you know, I'm more comfortable with that. We've never heard that comment. We, you hear people that just don't manage, they buy the gym membership and don't use it. Uh, but the people that do get the gym membership and really start to use it, there is a positive feedback back loop that starts to happen there. The more you work with it, the more you have breakthroughs, you realize, oh my God, look at what it did for me this time. So it's very, very powerful. Cool. 
Thank you both very, very much. On that note, we shall wrap up this episode of the ABT Time Podcast. And everybody get out there and check out the book and the paperback version. I think we'll be ready in a couple of weeks. Right now, it's just Kindle on Amazon. And everybody go have fun. See you next time on the ABT Podcast.